Welcome to the Psychology World Podcast with me, Conor Whiteley, psychology student and international best-selling psychology author of over 30 psychology books, bringing you the latest psychology news, fascinating psychology topics and more each week. If you want to learn more, then please check out conorwhiteley.net forward slash books. And don't forget to like and subscribe to the YouTube video or follow on your favourite podcast app. And here's the show. Hi everyone and welcome to episode 202 of the Psychology World Podcast with me, Colin Whiteley. And today's episode is on what is mass violence fatigue. And it is Friday the 28th of April 2023 as I record this. So uh, today's episode is actually really great and I actually really enjoyed it. And this is one that I'm actually particularly proud of because uh, even though this is a sort of dark topic because we do talk about mass shootings, we do, we do talk about mass violence and those sort of negative aspects and especially if you're in certain countries then it's a lot more important than, than others. But this is still a really good topic that we actually need to talk about because we do get fatigued when we see tons of these mass violence events. So it's actually important to understand why this actually happens and also what can we do about it. So so we don't talk about politics, we don't talk about anything in today's episode that isn't psychology based. And the real world eclipse and mass experiences might be more US centric than normally but they're still useful and they still help to put today's episode into perspective. So moving on to the psychology news section we're reading from the British Psychological Society Research Digest and the first one I thought was fascinating. So but the first one is your job that can shape your cognitive abilities. The job that you do can change your brain This has been famously been found in London cab drivers, but also acupuncturists, typists, musicians and airport security officers. There is also evidence that the more intellectually stimulating jobs bring cognitive benefits which extend into later life. This past work has found job related in improvement in skills like touch discrimination and emotion regulation. Now a new study finds that a job that challenges a key aspect of a cognitive function, the updating of information held in working memory, improves this ability too. So there's two reasons why I just love this, because I really do enjoy neuroplasticity. Again, I've never studied, never read an academic paper on it but I do like um, looking it up every so often though because neuroplasticity is how your brain changes in demand to the environment I think it's fascinating and it's brilliant it's actually one of the first um, psychology topics I ever learned and to be honest I think that's why it's one of my favorites because it's so interesting and it's honestly fascinating and the idea that what we do for living that can actually have a physical impact on ourselves and our brain and biology, I think is absolutely brilliant. And it's these sort of fascinating, really quite interesting things that I love about psychology because few other disciplines I could actually have some animal slight of that specific. So I think it's really good that we are researching this. I always think it's fascinating. And I think that... Um, biological psychology as much as I have no interest in it past what I have to learn for exams in the past I still think it's brilliant and it does have a lot of impact on ourselves. So the second one is prejudice those linked to dislike of diverse Star Wars characters. Oh I saw I wonder do they mention what I'm thinking of Many fans welcomed the diverse cast introduced in the most recent trilogy of our Star Wars films, but others found it more challenging to accept the new characters. Some detractors have claimed that they simply don't like how these characters are written, 
but others have directed racist and sexist comments towards the cast and the crew, suggesting that at least some of the hostility towards these characters is in a form to have pre-existing biases. A new study suggests that most of this criticism may in a deeper be driven by the rise of prejudices. The team finds that fans with sexist and racist attitudes tend to have a greater dislike of these characters. Ah, so they didn't mention what I was thinking of, but in the absolutely brilliant, well, maybe not absolutely brilliant, but it was definitely a really good one. Star Wars T, the program, Obi-Wan, um, on like a Disney Plus, well, the main villain to that was a black woman. And I've seen some truly disgusting racist comments aimed at her, because apparently, <laughs> according to one very, very stupid man, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna flat out call him stupid, stupid old brother, that he was stealing a white person's job. Well, for starters, that's just completely wrong. Jobs don't belong to anyone because it's why jobs are open. Therefore, the best person. And if the directors believe that she was the best person for this particular role, then it went to her right, and she was actually a great actress. And how they did her character was really, really good. Though I actually had no problem like at all. Whatsoever with the, the new Star Wars cast, though, and it was only when I read the, the like sexist comment bit out when I was thinking, Oh, why, well, of course, so that's what's happened because, of course, Ray, yeah, because, of course, the Ray character played by Daisy Ridley, I think that's her name. Well, she's a woman, Finn's a black guy. I didn't even notice it, but of course, I know some people wouldn't have been happy about it, but Daisy Ridley. Brilliant actress, I have a lot of sympathy and support for her. She's brilliant. So I think the takeaway from this is just before any of us criticize some something, I think we need to see why are we being critical of it. For example, I was reading a like a book though and I was like loving it, but then I was being a bit critical of it. Then I was thinking, well, are you criticizing this as a reader or as someone who knows the the like craft of like writing and the author did make a few mistakes but it was still such a good book so just try and be a bit more mindful and I think that's something that we've all got to do me included or oh, the last one's particularly good and the final one is juror biased against defendants who make a a secular affirmation. Most of us are familiar with the image of a someone in a court with their hands on the Bible swearing an oath to tell the truth. Even if we haven't been in a court ourselves, we have still seen defendants being sworn in like this on TV or in movies. For those who prefer a secular approach, however, swearing an oath to God isn't necessary. In countries like the UK, the USA and Australia, a non-religious affirmation is available, allowing people to solemn to open quote, solemnly, sincerely, and truly declare and affirm their truthfulness. Close a quote. Secular versions of such declarations no doubt appear to non-religious witnesses and defendants. But how do Jewish perceive those who choose an affirmation over an oath? And could these perceptions affect trial outcomes? A recent study finds that although hypothetical defendants were not generally considered guilty when given a secular affirmation, mock jurors themselves who swore a religious oath did discriminate against those who affirmed. Oh, okay, so that's really interesting. As I'm not religious, I would never be and um, anything and anything like that and I have no problem whatsoever if people do want to take a like, religious oath but personally I wouldn't want to I've got no interest in that personally so I think it's really good that there is a affirmation version I think it's interesting that basically discriminated against by jurors who actually are religious so it's interesting and I think now that we've got this finding, I think we need to counter it somehow. 
because I think this could have quite dangerous impacts was of course if you've got an innocent secular person but you've got a jury full of religious people who are automatically going to discriminate against them because they're not religious then that has massive implications for justice so I think we do need to find a way to counter it now that we've got this information really really interesting so I hope you enjoy the psychology news section. So let's move on to the personal update. So we're moving on to the personal update. So this week I've been doing tons of different bits and pieces and quite a few little projects. And I've also been going out with family members. So yesterday I went to the Tower of London, in London obviously. <laughs> And I really do recommend it. It's a lot of fun. It's really interesting, especially with how they've built on it over the past um, 900 years. So it's really interesting. Tons of different towers. We got to see some of the crown jewels because, of course, some of them have been taken for our king's coronation, which happens on uh, my birthday. So I've done a few jokes about that, like. Um, I, like um i forget like one of them was that um two kings were coronated like that day and like stuff like that if i was younger that would probably be funnier <laughs> yeah but um it was a great day really nice time though like with uh, my family and it's nice that because it's still the university break i've actually got a lot more time to go out and do more tourist things I've been meaning to go to the Tower of London for ages and I'm really glad that I went. It was fun. And I've also been put into work over two issues of the Psychology World magazine for January and February 2024. So that's coming along well. And I know I don't talk about the Psychology World magazine anywhere near enough. I can assume how much I love it and how much of a good deal it is. So I'm actually going like, to be mind you guys. So in case you don't know what the Psychology World magazine is, is that each month, it's always the first Friday of the month, unlike um, Amazon, no, but like the print versions um, released, but soon it will be available at all major bookstores, and you can also order it from your life, well, in a like, few weeks time though. But uh, the Psychology World magazine that is actually a really great deal that I feel like all of you uh, because not only is there five uh, blog posts uh, from the previous uh, podcast episodes on it but there's also uh, a brand new psychology book uh, which is always released about two to three weeks before the book itself individually is actually released to the general public. And then there's also a, a backlist book that was a, a book that um, that is new, but um, but it's been at least for quite a while though. But so it's actually a really great deal though because you get five blog posts, two psychology books for a really a great price. So some I really do like recommend it. So as always, I always like, love to hear your thoughts and feelings on today's episode. So you can always email me conwiley conwiley.net. You can always leave a comment at the show notes at conorwiley.net forward slash podcast and you can always tweet me on Twitter at sci-fi wiley or leave a comment on the Facebook post at conorwiley psychology author. And today's episode has been sponsored by Forensic Psychology. So the reason why this is the sponsored product for today's episode is, is because of course mass shootings is a crime and the entire point of Forensic Psychology is not profiling i will say that straight up just so no one's disappointed when they buy the book i talk about profiling in another book called criminal profiling and i will give you the heads up criminal profiling is rubbish and it's not psychology <laughs> but forensic psychology is all about the scientific study of criminal behavior so why do we commit crimes why do people commit sexual offenses well, offences are, well, why do they offend you like the uh, first place? Right. And also covers a lot more great topics, so, uh, so I really do like, recommend it. And the way how this connects into like, today's episode is that there's actually an, an entire section of forensic psychology that talks about violent offences and why people commit violent offences in uh, the first place, though. 
So it really does help you to actually understand what we talk about in like today's episode from a different angle and in a lot more depth. So I really do recommend it. So, but that's forensic psychology available from all major ebook retailers, and you can get the paperback and the hardback version from Amazon, your local bookstore, or local library if you request it. And whilst buying the books helps us to support the podcast itself, my time in creating the podcast episode, which takes about four hours, is sponsored by my wonderful patrons which I'm always eternally grateful for. And if you wanted to see a the podcast on a monthly basis and I get tons of other like great benefits like early access to the um blog posts well the blog posts that get some behind the scene information and there's tons of other great information then please check out patreon.com forward slash the psychology world a podcast i really do recommend it it's a lot of fun and i do love my patrons so well that's enough of the personal update let's move on to the content part of today's episode so we're moving on to the content part of today's episode so we're going to be talking about what is bass violence and fatigue and because this is a podcast episode that I sort of need to like set the scene for, I actually just want to dive straight into it. Why am I talking about desensitization to mass violence? So but for the first section of this podcast episode, I just want to sort of like set the scene. I really want to stress about why this is in a, important to talk about. So I live in the UK. And the worst mass violence events that me, as a 22-year-old man, can remember is the Plymouth mass shooting in 2021, and that was connected to incels, and that was the UK's worst mass shooting in 11 years, and then the mass shooting before that was the one that resulted in the UK changing its gun laws overnight to make, well, to basically make it impossible to actually get guns and actually make it legal and to be honest I have no idea how you would even legally go about getting a gun. I know shotguns are to some extent but I know that has to be licensed and yeah I yeah yeah I literally have no idea and to be honest I don't care I really have no intention of ever getting a gun. Another mass violence event I remember is the Manchester Arena bombing in 2015 that killed tens and injured many more people. And I was also alive for the London bombings. And also that because it was quite early in the 2000s, and of course I don't remember that, I was way too young. Um, I'm not sure if it was called the London bombings or the London Marathon bombings. I think it was the latter. So, as you can see, I can remember about three mass violent events, and to be honest, I might have missed two or three. I fully admit that. But if we counter this with the assessment of the US's mass shooting report that, that Sky News actually like put out in like late December 2022, to, and I mean, they did a great job. I mean, I was really impressed with all the information that they gave me. I mean, the US situation is very, very different. In 2022, over 20,000 children died in mass shootings. And it was more common in the US to have a mass shooting than not. And mass shootings, they are basically normalised in the US. I've sort of deduced that. I've spoken to tons of US students at my university that have said the same thing. And yeah, but I really do find that children's statistic heartbreaking and quite distressing to some extent. And as a person writing this post, I can remember when me, my parents and my friends were never being accounted a news report of a mass shooting in the US. We were shocked, surprised and we had a reaction to it. I mean, we had a strong reaction because it was like, oh my God, I mean, like, how would this happen? Why would someone do this? Do this. And that was really true for the Las Vegas shooting a few years ago when there was the sniper. Yes, and like he was picking off people at the concert. 
if I remember that correctly. Nowadays, a few little weeks ago, we watched a report of the mass shooting and we honestly didn't have a reaction to it beyond the normal, that's a shame, that should not have happened, why does this keep happening, those children never deserve to die. That was the extent of our reaction. Strong condemnation, but we didn't have a strong emotional reaction to it. To it, that's the echo sentiment reaction nowadays, because everyone in the UK, and I imagine everyone outside the US, knows that mass shootings will never stop, change, and people, including children, will just keep dying. Because, yeah, yeah, and again, uh, this is not a political show, so I won't mention why. Anyway, that isn't the point of the podcast episode. episode. My point is that myself and my family alone used to have a strong emotional reaction to a mass shooting. But now, we don't. No one does. Because this is so common. And uh, to be honest, though, this honestly doesn't make me and my family bad people at all. Because we aren't in the country like a facade, so like I imagine that if we were in the US, then yes, we would have a stronger emotional reaction because because it's where we live. But we aren't, so that's one factor. But also though, but it also just means that we've gone through a desensitization process to these acts of mass violence, and every and everyone like goes through this. Even the media does because Sky News itself mentioned that the only reason why they were reporting on a mass shooting a few weeks ago was because of who the shooter was and they used to go to the school. That's it. They didn't they didn't report this because the children were sadly dead. They didn't report on this because um, it was a mass shooting. They didn't report on this because the person was using an automatic rifle. They were mentioning it because of yeah, just those two factors. It's not news anymore. Now, I personally, I think that's disgusting, but but again, I'm not going to divert this podcast episode. Yeah, because like, to be honest, I will, like, to be honest, I sort of had a sense that some people will turn off this podcast episode, not because of the subject topic, but because they're angry at me. <laughs> but this does lead us to ask though, why do people go through this process of desensitization and what happens when they are exposed to mass violence over and over again? That's something that we've got to look at now. What is mass violent fatigue? As I outlined in the section above, as the number of mass violent acts sadly increases over time, a lot of people reach a point where they're no longer shocked by these tragic and outrageous events. Another example of this decrease of a shock is the COVID-19 pandemic. Because at the beginning of lockdown, a lot of people were scared, concerned, and they were very emotional about the number of our people dying. Yet, after months and months of lockdown and government mismanagement in the UK, a lot of people felt psychologically and emotionally numb and exhausted. Moreover, the loss of social support, generalised anxiety and loss of concentration that a lot of people experience after a mass shooting or another form of mass violence. And these consequences and feelings that are increasing because of the increasing number of mass shootings, they all only add to our level of desensitisation. Now, all of it is perfectly normal, but tragic. It is a part of us as have been humans to get desensitized to a, a stimulus after a while. It is our survival mechanism after all, as well as it is a strategy that helps us to continue our daily lives, focus our brains on what it needs to do so we can work, live and have a life outside of our constant fear and anxiety. This is why we become emotionally and psychologically numb during COVID because our brains needed to be numb so we could focus on surviving a massive global pandemic. Overall, mass violence fatigue is another term for the desensitization people go through after being egg exposed to an act of mass violence time and time again. Why we can't let mass violence fatigue control us. 
In addition, we need to overcome our desensitization and we cannot ever allow mass violence fatigue to control us and make us ignore this stuff, since at some point the numbness will fade. Or, and I truly, truly hope this never happens to any of you, it will be ripped away from you. Either because you are the victim of a mass violence act itself, or because you know someone who personally is. Due to, if we don't deal with or we don't learn of lessons from the devastation these acts of mass violence cause is, as well as the feelings of paralysis and how overwhelming it is, it will only grow and grow, these fears. How can we improve mental health damage to by mass violence? Whenever we experience an act of mass violence or a mass shooting, we need to give ourselves the time and the space to allow ourselves to process what the hell just happened, and we need to process the pain safely. We need to talk about the traumatic events, we need to feel safe talking about this too. You back and feel safe with a loved one, family, friends, a therapist, a support group or someone else entirely. Just make sure you talk about it and you will make sense of the events as well as understand what the events means for you and those around you since it is this understanding and meaning that we personally give to it that helps us feel in control of what happened instead of us letting the event control us and we give it more power than it deserves. Additionally, I recently saw an article on Psychology Today with a really good title that I personally thought of um, something along the lines of are we becoming the United States of learnt helplessness? Now, I didn't click on it because I'm not American and I wasn't really looking at um, learnt helplessness at the time. But if you are an American, or to be honest, I think anyone, it would be a really interesting reason. After this, I might jump back onto psychology today to actually have a look at it. Because, I mean, it's such an interesting concept and I do agree with the basic premise. To some extent, but to go back to my own uh, blog post, yet the idea of learnt helplessness after a mass shooting is important to understand because when fully trained and armed police officers fail to even act in the storming and stop a shooter, then of course you will feel powerless and, and helpless. This is even more important when those in power don't seem to be doing anything to make the situation better and the whole cycle of mass shootings, deaths and more mass shootings just continue again and again. Therefore, with all this going on, people do feel helpless, alone, and they start to think nothing can ever be done to decrease mass violence in their country, whatever one it might be. This is why it's a good idea to build and maintain meaningful social relationships, because social support is a critical to our mental health and survival. As well as limit media egg exposure to violence is another good idea, so that you can reset yourself and avoid it. But if these emotions continue, then maybe professional help is needed. Conclusion Personally, this was a really tough episode episode though and even though this is actually the, the second time I've recorded this content part this is still harder for me because I had a slight audio glitch glitch so so this is still hard although because I don't like mass shootings I don't like the reasons behind them and I hate the reasons why mass shootings are basically allowed to happen continue even more but of course this podcast is not political so I'm not even going to bother touching on on right on that and I, will, and I would also never touch on publicly another country's uh, politics. But reading those statistics of 20,000 dead children was hard for me. And it still is. I, it is quite distressing because there's 20,000 innocent people dead. dead there. And that's just children. That's not including the adults. That's not including so many more innocent people. So this is why this was a dark topic and this is hard for me to talk about and record, but I want to do it.
do it with that because the reason why I actually wanted to do this was just so I could do something because I completely agree that desensitization isn't right in response to mass shootings but it happens therefore there was nothing will a change about this situation for years if ever I wanted to at least do something so if you are ever unfortunately involved in a mass violence event then you will know that you aren't alone what's happened to you isn't right and there are some steps that you can take if, if you will want to be a cover and reset yourself. I know this was a dark topic, but it needed to be done. Not only for my own interest in this area, but so everyone else in and impacted by an act of mass violence knows that there are some steps that they can take if needed. Mass violence is wrong on so many levels, but I just wanted to do something to help its victims in a small way if I possibly could. So I really hope that you enjoyed today's episode and you got something out of it. I know that I did and the slightly annoying thing about uh, this being a, a second take is that when I first re-recorded this uh, in the conclusion there was a really funny joke. Yeah, but like a joke there about like if aliens were listening to this then I would be scared. I was talking about how we're all a human, but sadly I tried it and I just couldn't get the same um, impact. So that really did help to lighten this up. But I know this was a serious one, and um, I have got lots of really light podcast episodes that are coming up as a, as a sort of massive palate cleanser. But this needed to be said. I really wanted to do because I do find this topic really interesting, especially when it comes to mass violence. So we will not be covering this for, well, for ages, and I really, really mean that, but I hope you found it useful. If you know someone who would enjoy today's episode, then please um, share it with them. I'm always really grateful when you wonderful people help spread the word today about the podcast. And definitely check out Forensic Psychology, available in all digital places. It's a great book and it will really help you understand more about forensic psychology. And if you wanted to support my time in creating the show and get a sense of a great benefit, then please go to patreon.com forward slash the psychology world podcast. Link available in the podcast description. So have a great day everyone and I'll see you next time. Thanks for listening today. I hope you found it helpful. Please have remember to like the video and subscribe to the, the YouTube channel and follow the podcast on your favourite podcast app. And if you wanted to learn more, then please check out the backlist of the podcast episodes or my books at conwhitely.net. So have a great day and I'll see you next time.